lack of flight hours and overworked maintainers have been reported to be the systemic root causes of aircraft crashes and other mishaps. These causes have been ongoing problems we are still trying to find solutions for. This is Systemic Issues. All right, so another another uh, article or document review today. Mm. This one's uh, published from Air Force Magazine, and it is on the systematic aircrew maintenance issues root cause of DOD mishap rates. Uh, this article was written December 3rd of 2020, so just under a year ago. Um, and a little uh, excerpt at the beginning uh, about this, about the, what this, you know, all encompassing about the article Members of the National Commission on Military Aviation Safety observe a C-17 Globemaster III inside a hangar on Joint Base Lewis-McChord, Washington, on January 7th of 2020. The NCMAS visited the JBLM, which is the Joint Base Lewis-McChord, to assess and gather information on the full range of manning, training, and equipment issues associated with aviation safety. Hmm. Hmm. I bet we find some things in here that we've uh, covered before <laughs> say it ain't so and uh, and the sad part is the yet yeah, the report came out a year ago but we still find ourselves relatively in the same situation and then the study itself the, or the national the safety survey that they're doing spanned about five years from 2013 to 2018 and they released it two years later so from that time till now you still see some of the same gaps that are happening. Like what the hell is going on? Everybody. Well, well, look at this. Look at this. The first, uh, first few sentences of the first paragraph, a lack of flying hours and overworked maintainers are contributing to high rates of crashes and other aviation mishaps. According to a new congressionally mandated report, which called on the services to quickly overhaul how they manage maintainers and pilot training. (laughs) I mean, I'm, I'm laughing. I mean, crashes aren't funny, but like, my God, it's it's reports after reports and it's all the same thing but at this point it feels like all we're doing is reporting it we're not actually doing anything about it doing yeah. anything to resolve it. like it's like it's like whoever's running the shops right in the services or whatever or in any shop really but they're going yeah take don't, don't muddy this up with facts we know we know what we're doing yeah like that what's that meme you said like has that kid playing with toys and it says scheduling wants this and that and they go. I bet it's because I bet it's because we're not working eighteen hour days. It's oh yeah, behind. Oh yeah, you it, know was what I mean? a, it was a a person like they they tripped and dropped their um their lunch, <laughs> and yeah. they're like, I bet this is I bet this is all because of this. <laughs> it's, exact, it's exactly how this feels. They're like, yeah, 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 you're saying that, but I bet the root cause is because we're not working enough. Yeah. Or what's a what was that one video that one training video you sent me? It was like. Where does the square peg go? That's right in the square hole. Where does the rectangle go? That's right, the square hole. <laughs> yeah. Where does the round peg go? You guessed it, the square hole. And it has like <laughs> it showed it said quality and engineering, right? And quality was doing the fitting all the pegs through the one hole, right? Finding the finding the problems in the process. And the engineer slowly just started crying, head in their hands, like <laughs> found right. all the prop. Yeah. Where does the bridge peg go? That's right. Inside the square hole. Like, no, please no. <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, like I'm not gonna lie, as soon as you said that first paragraph, that was like a giant left hook into pretty much every major aviation industry ever, basically. Like this yeah, this is kind of, this one's kind of taking a jab at the military. Well the military's like jabbing themselves really but this i feel like this is across the board like almost every single aviation entity unless it's like a two-person owned shop have these problems lack of flying hours and maintainers not getting what they need and overworked saying so which you kind of wonder right you kind of wonder is the lack of flying hours because the airframe is is garbage and it's a bad design, and so it breaks repeatedly, or the avionics package in it isn't up to snuff, or is it just, you know, and and so it's down, it's NMC'd because it's got maintenance to, or is it just there's no real mission, there's no real flying time? But if that's the case, if that's the case, you know, why are they still working twelve or overworking maintainers at that point? Ooh, hey, the thing can't break if it's not flying. I mean, you, you think. 
I mean, you would think, but you would expect or or assume. I that's guess. what that's what any um, non aviation person would say. That well, if it doesn't fly, it's just not going to break. False. <laughs> that's a big false. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing taxi checks or maybe you're doing testing, you know, you're on a test unit and you're on a test bird and you're incorporating all these new harnesses and and components and whatever else and you're testing different things out yeah you'll break things in testing without flying Mm -hmm. you know you'll break it on the ground but but just the way the article reads it sounds like you know lack of flying hours like hey we're we're flying 10 hours a week and uh we got uh 560 hours of maintenance time like what what are you doing in those flights i guess then yeah if it's a test unit and you're stress testing something or whatever else. Yeah. And you're putting it through the paces. Okay. So you might have excess amount of, uh, extra inspections you have to do because of that testing. Mm -hmm. But let's just say it's a normal, a normal operating, you know, combat unit or whatever. I mean, I I don't, I don't, you you know, the correlation is kind of hard to see. Right. So, so I, I have an opinion on it, but let's see what the article says. Uh, let's see if my opinion and the article line up. (laughs) So the National Commission on Military Aviation Safety looked at more than 6,000 aviation mishaps, which include 198 deaths, 157 aircraft destroyed, and about 9.4, 9.41 billion in losses from 2013 to 2018. None of these losses were due to combat operations. Ooh. Oh, what the Ooh. hell? Ooh. Big left hook. Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, so so and so they had 90 days to respond and then this one's kind of taking a big uppercut to the Air Force right now Uh, the Air Force saw a decrease in Class A mishaps however there was an increase in Class C mishaps largely because maintenance or other on the ground issues Class A mishaps are categorized as any mishaps that result in the destruction of an aircraft or a permanent and total disability of a person over the or damages over 2.5 million dollars uh, class C is a one that results in injury causing a loss of more than a day's worth of time off and anywhere between 600000 to $2 million. Well, well I, mean, I guess, I guess that's a, a positive. If we're looking at the silver lining. All right. We're, <laughs> we're going from total loss and loss of life and loss of vehicle or whatever else to uh, severe bruises, scrapes, abrasions, and less dollar amounts. Right. So, just right off the bat, since it's talking about non-combat missions, I can, uh, this is already starting to line up with my theory that majority of these were just training missions, right? Uh, mm-hmm. We need to keep the, the pilots, the air crew, and the maintainers current on their, on their um, job proficiency, right? Because pilots have to fly a certain amount of hours just to stay rated as pilots. That's across the board in any aviation industry. Uh, the air crew members have to be rated in the air or whatever their job is, like say being a fuel pro boom operators or air crew gun quals, stuff like that. They got to do that too. And then the maintainer. Well, yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. And then the maintainers themselves, right? They, you can't just roll out of school and just expect to fucking know everything. They have to go through these t- training steps, right? To go from being an apprentice or a trainee to an apprentice to a journeyman and so forth. Right. And the only way for you to do that is it to crank out more hours, like have the aircraft going, have the aircraft do stuff. Because there's only so many times you can uh, paint or there's only so many times you can do a pre-wash lubrication on on an aircraft. Right. Well, I guess I didn't think about the training aspect of it. Right. So training, training pilots and, and maintainers uh, are going to be rough on the asset for sure, mm-hmm. just because they're learning still. Right. Um, so I guess I could see the downtime coming from that. Yeah. Hey, it was just a normal training mission, but they bounced it twice during the day. They uh, maybe pulled an over G or suspected air quote suspected. They pulled an over G mm-hmm. so that that generates a whole lot of extra inspections you got to do. And then so during those inspections, you know, you get a new guy and he strips out, you know, 45 of the 120 fasteners on this panel. So now you got to drill that stuff out. And oh, guess what? The drill bit walked. <laughs> so now you've got marring up on the, on the skin of the aircraft. So now you got to bring in your specialty uh, air framers in there to clean that up and assess the damage. Mm-hmm. And so I, I guess I can see it from that aspect then. Yeah. 
And so the thing goes on, like the recurring themes were not enough flying hours for the pilots, which I kind of mentioned. Maintainers are distracted by excessive duties, inadequate prioritization of safety, insufficient data collection, a lack of consistent funding and a relentless operation tempo. Wow. <laughs> Say it ain't so. <laughs> oh, man. We're just going to come right out with it. Huh? <laughs> right. Come in with that right hook. <laughs> As an uppercut straight to the gut. <laughs> right. Uh, I, um, my theory is already proven, is already starting to prove out. <laughs> so the excessive duties one, I, I can, I guess I could sympathize with that one, right? On the maintainers aspect. So. I was not at, never active duty, but worked enough with them. And and some of the guys in my shop now are retired military um, from a few different branches. But they've all talked about, hey, beyond beyond our general job duties that we had to do every day, which were 12 to 16 hours, we still had to maintain um, regular military. Uh, uh, help me out here, Six. What, what are some of the oh, like terminology? Pro- oh, like proficiency? Yeah. Yeah, your proficiencies, you know, you had to also, they were talking, they were, hell, the guys in the shop were just talking yesterday about how um, they'd work a 16 hour day, but then they had the next morning, their boots still had to be polished and they had to have creases in the right places, their uniforms, and they still had to do all these extra things. And also they were talking about how from the time they got in to the time they retired, when they would have to write up personal evals Mm -hmm. in the block that they were, you would just type it up and it would, you know, you know how kind of you type it a paper and the the right hand uh, margin isn't always lined up. It's just wherever the sentence kind of ends or the word ends and how it moves to the next line. Right. So initially it was okay to do that, but now it's, you have to fit everything within one line and it has to touch margin to margin it has to be square on both sides. So they have to go in there and mess with spacing and parameters. So worrying about that kind of stuff too. And you're like, Holy shit. Yeah. Like, is that how the terrorists win? Because my margins are not aligned. Like, <laughs> You know, it's that, it's that kind of extra, extra duty stuff that you're, it's just frying maintainers brains when they need to be focusing on the task at hand and getting those aircraft green. They're doing that, but also going, man, my boots aren't shiny enough and all. Also, my creases aren't right and shit. My margins are out of whack, you know? Right. And that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, and then bake sales. God, I've never seen, I didn't realize this, but with the current place that I'm working, the current, the local unit. They have like a bake sale every week or every other week. And it's part of what they have to do Mm -hmm. in order to make that next rank. Yeah. And that shit blew my mind. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, you like to make rank is a bake sale. Yeah. You have to do, I can't remember what they call it, but you have to do so many of like, is it community service hours or it's some fun, it's fundraising, so many hours of fundraising or whatever. So what they do is the easiest thing, which is a bake sale or they'll do like a breakfast bar or whatever else and right. Charge you for it. And, and, okay, it's all well and good, but like, that's the shit you have to also focus on because <laughs> that's what's going to take you, get you the next rank, which goes into what we've talked about before, where oftentimes decisions are made at the highest level. Cause those individuals, they don't give a shit because all they're looking for is what they have to do to make that next rank. Not right. about what's best for the people there or best for that asset or best for the mission. It's best for what gets me to that next level. Right. And, and, each service is played play their, that requirement a little differently, but it's relatively the same. The idea behind that uh, specific concept is they want everyone in the service to have what they what they deem as the whole service member concept, right? And and it varies from one service to the other. Like uh, the army says, we want the the whole the well rounded soldier to be like proficient in their job, but also know how to like do extracurriculars or some shit, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Marines, they say every Marine's a rifleman. So on top of you being a wrench turn, you got to know how to shoot guns and blow things up too. Yeah. And, and vice versa for all the other services. I don't know the full details, but that's generally what that means and how that plays into their promotion or their, their, uh, time progression is they look at how good they are at their job. And they also see what they, what else they've done. They go like, yeah, cool. Um, you, you, you're smart in the aircraft, which is your primary duty, which is fantastic. But what else have you done? Like, what the fuck else do you mean? What else have I fucking done? Yeah, I've like, spent 16 hours a day for the la- for seven days a week for the last nine months mm-hmm. busting my butt to make sure this mission goes off. And we haven't been late. Uh, we haven't missed one mission, uh, have minimized our maintenance downtime, 
um, increased, you know, increased positive hours of flight time. Yak, 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 yak. That, no, right. that's not good enough, though. Right. How many cookies have you sold? <laughs> Did you raise enough money for, uh, for, for, the, the, for the wings bar? Hmm? <laughs> Did you? Did you? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Uh, that's a whole another rabbit hole, and we can totally talk about this if you guys want us to do it. Because that's that's a huge rabbit hole that we're going to go down and uh, uh, vice versa. There's also ones where like they focus a lot on those side of the house, right? Like the extracurricular, well-rounded service member concept. But then they kind of neglect their. Their primary duties, which is a which is say be an aviation mechanic. So they are decent at being aviation mechanics, but they're fucking awesome at PT or they can do like a like all the push ups or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah. So, or their uniforms always pristine and their hand, but their hands are clean because they're not doing actually any work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, this guy is a poster child of, of the branch and put them on all the, po- you know, put them on all the commercials and everything else. But like, you've had that told me that before because like, there was that video going around the guy and he was like the most fit soldier or whatever else. And you're like, yeah, what, what's his MOS though? That was your first question. What's his MOS? Because I bet you he, he don't have a fucking skill set. <laughs> it's true though. Like, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I, I would agree with you, right? You know, it, it's 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 kind of the the mind the mindset of almost every service member. If someone is winning at working out, it kind of makes me question. Like, if you got all the time in the world to work out, and it looks like you do, I mean, you better be kick ass at your job. That's all I'm gonna fucking say. <laughs> so yeah, so the looking at this. They also mentioned that, you know, like a high operations tempo and mind you, this study was done in the middle of like, uh, like budget cuts and sequestration and all that. So that played a big deal into a lot of the mishaps themselves for everyone else who's been in the service or anyone who's been in the aviation industry when they were going through like some budgetary reconstruction or something like that. It became, it becomes really hard to plan out your budget when your budget's constantly in flux. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you know, it, it takes you, let's say, let's b- fake a number like one million dollars to run a year's worth of airport or aviation operations. And then your budget letter comes in and says, OK, your budget is supposed to be one million, but now it's seven hundred fifty thousand. Wait, what the fuck? <laughs> so yeah, why don't don't ask questions? This is what you get now. Yeah. So then now you're like, well, that cuts. Now you got to figure out, like, how do I turn? Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in the gold. I'm like, well, I guess we don't have to do this no more. Uh, we we can't fly less, so we're gonna have to stop doing this, 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 etc. And then they come in again, and so right when you have the budget plan for seven hundred fifty thousand, then they say, okay, now your budget's down to six hundred thousand. Well, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, and then uh, it goes like that, and then you and then you figure it out. But then the next year after that, all right, you figure out how to operate on six hundred thousand. They're like, hey, you get one point five now. Well, Jesus, I already had to force half the unit to to get out of service just to be able to maintain, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, had to cut here, had to cut there. We got re- we had to uh, back off on some of our specialty tooling, you know, whatever the case may be. We had to cut back on training. Yeah, it's it's wild. Yeah. And and uh, the article here was telling like uh, the people are frustrated with the ops tempo. They're frustrated with the unpredictable funding. And they're also frustrated uh, being away from home as much as they are. That that definitely will will fuck up your human factors like instantly. Because if you, well, you it, go ahead, especially sorry. when you don't see the end goal, right? Or when you look at the in your, how things are operating, you're going, "This is a shit show." What yeah. am I? What am I even doing here? Like we've been out here six months, and every day is a dumpster fire. Like, what's our goal? What was our goal? Did we lose sight of that? Did we not have a goal? What's what's happening here? And then they're going, I can't believe I'm out here living in a tent in these harsh conditions or whatever it is for whatever it is exercise we're doing, but we're not really seeing any results or being fed any positive feedback or negative feedback for that matter. No feedback at all. We're just here and we exist. Yeah. What, and, they, and then that question starts coming in like, I'm kind of over this, kind of done with it. Yeah. And like say, or for like the commercial airliners, for instance, they, they see on the news like, oh, so-and-so big company is getting, is uh, getting like a four point something billion dollar budget, right? 
And then you as the the guys on the ground, like, okay, cool. We're going to get better stuff. We're going to at least get better pensions or some shit. And then they find out that all that money is getting diverted to make something look nicer or to uh, design a whole nother whatever. And they're like, but what about had- all our shitty GSC that's like ricketing down the flight line? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I have a guy in my shop now, retired, uh, retired military. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I should say the branch or not. Nah, that's fine. Rhymes with smush more smin. Anyways, I guess my I won't say it, but yeah. anyways, he was telling me that when he was like, I'll oh, probably, probably six, seven years in and they got new budget. So they thought they were going to get new. Uh, and he was, um, he was a weapons troop. I'll just say that. Uh-huh. So he thought they were going to get new jammers, new uh, stuff to, you know, load up. Cause they were using like Vietnam era equipment. Yep. And he's like, awesome. And he's like, nope. They spent it all on making the grounds around the hangar looking nice. He's like, mind you, we're in a desert base of operations. And he goes, they bought me, they bought us several five gallon buckets of white paint. And myself and one other guy, he said, for weeks, we had to go to all the rocks that were out front in like the little wing units, you know, sign outside of the. Hanger. Anybody who's been on the military base, you know, each unit in the hangers you roll up, they got like a nice little sign with metal or a wall, like a stone wall with metal lettering on it. Mm-hmm. Yakety yak. You know, have, you know, stones in the ground around it. But he had to go dip every one of those stones in white paint and then put it back on the ground. So it was brand new, pristine looking white paint. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, he, and that's the kind of stuff that makes you go. What am I doing here? <laughs> right. I came here to learn things and do cool stuff. And I'm dipping rocks into <laughs> buckets of paint. So they look whiter and right. nicer. Right. Okay. Let, let's not for, let, let's totally just ignore the fact that our GSC is just ricketing, like be bopping down the flight line on their last, yeah. last leg, you know, <laughs> like that tug I've talked about in the past where the cable, the throttle cable kept snapping and eventually got to the point where we had to control it by a pair of vice grips on it. And we just had to pull it in and push it. Pull it out to go faster and push it back in to slow down. Jeez. Ta- uh, towing multi-million dollar aircraft. Like, all right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. What could go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. What, what could, could go wrong? wrong? This, <laughs> this is fine. Everything. It's like that. It's like that meme where that dog's sitting there and everything's on fire or around him. He's, this is fine. This is fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what about the pilots? Right. Like, cause I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to their problems, but at the same time, you know, you know I mean? Like we as maintainers, we're always, we're always more concerned about, why the fuck are we always flying? Why the fuck are we always doing this, et cetera, et cetera. So from the pilot's perspective, they complained about a lack of real flying hours and an over-reliance on simulators. See, this is kind of a stab at me because I remember I used to talk shit about pilots saying like, why don't you guys just go fly in the damn simulator? Like save the plane for when you actually got to do something major, right? Especially when it comes to UAVs. Like what does actually flying the real bird for you differ from the simulator right Other than, from my perspective that shouldn't be there shouldn't be any difference at all right and so this article goes like while simulators are effective at practicing emergency routines they do not effectively replicate intense real world flying that can contribute to a lack of proficiency now this one i can specifically talk to because um whenever most militaries when they train up their pilots they just give them the bare minimum and then kick them out. Kind of like uh, uh, what, when we had that one episode with uh, Tim from Arte. It's like, day one, you're in the seat. Like, fuck, really? <laughs> no, no similar time, nothing? Okay. okay. All right. Uh, we, we're doing this. Fuck it. <laughs> but, Go up on the collective. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> move. Uh, boop scoot. All right. <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> Wait, we're, Jesus, help me out today. <laughs> and then, so they give them just enough hours to like, okay, you know what the hell to do you at least have some basic idea of how to fly a plane fantastic and then as soon as they're done with their basic rate they send them off to whatever other follow-on schools like uh survival and evasion uh how to be a military officer and all this other stuff so like they will only sit in the seat for a certain amount of time and the rest of it is just being compounded with all kinds of other how to military training (laughs) and so by the time they get to their first unit Fuck, some of them, it's been like months since they sat in the seat. So when they actually uh, have time for them to get into a plane, 
it's like riding the bike for the first time again. Like, fuck, I don't remember what these do. <laughs> yeah, by the time you get back around to it, right? You go through all your initial flight school or whatever else. Okay, you finished that up. Now you're going to go do this. And then six months later, you come back. You haven't touched. You haven't sat in the cockpit or of anything at all, including a simulator. And you come back and you're like, all right, uh, tomorrow we got a five hour mission flying from here to here to here to here. Plan it out. Uh, um, question. Okay. Good question. Yeah, go- What's flying? <laughs> yeah. It goes back to the it goes back to kind of the original. You've mentioned it a few times six of do more with less. Yes. And and uh, and that goes into so again with the pilots right when they when they freshly come to a unit their their seat time is like next to none at this point because they haven't done it enough and then um, a unit matter of fact any aviation organization they only have so many dollar amounts to for to fly and these are like committed to like actual revenue flights actual mission flights etc 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 and then now we got to take that budget and somehow f- fit in training these new pilots because they didn't accomplish a whole lot of it just to become pilots, you know? Right. So, so now we're like, fuck dude. Okay. Now I gotta, this is what I had for missions and this is what I have for revenue. I got to cut bits and pieces of these just so I can have my, my new kid pilot know how to fly and not crash. <laughs> right. And, and then this puts a lot of pressure on the new kid. So like, you only get one shot to get this right. And if you fuck it up, you're not flying again kind of thing. So Im- imagine that being that, that fresh new pilot. You come to the unit and they basically say, like, you will be proficient or else. I'm like, oh, cool. No pressure, guys. I mean, fuck. <laughs> well, that's the expectation. Like, well, you're just out of, out of flight school. You should know all this stuff. And you're like, it's same thing goes for mechs, too. But you're like, OK, uh, yeah, I mean, I learned all the basic info and i got a couple of hours in and i know how the aircraft handles this and that but i don't know everything about it you know like i've i've only done a few simulations and i've done a few hovers and i've done a few touch and goes and everything else but you're saying now that we're going to fly over open water uh and drop uh you know do munitions drops for training yeah well, I haven't dropped any munitions yet. Oh, well, you should know. You just came from the school. Yeah, but we don't have us doing that in school. <laughs> yeah, right. Like we're not dropping five hundred thousand dollar bombs every day in training because it's just too expensive. Right. If if they even have that kind of money to drop on training. No, they don't. I mean, that's that's the real thing. Is there? Really, but when you when you, the unit expects you to be able to do all that with one hundred percent accuracy with never having done it before. Because right. you got out of air quotes school. Right. Then that kind of highlights like issue one, right? So A, we don't have enough flight hours. And then B, well, we don't have a budget for all the flight hours. And then B, we have a pilot who doesn't have enough training hours in the seat, in the actual seat to fly the plane efficiently. So now we got to somehow fit it in to get him there and stay within our only fly so much budget. So so then now it could, that's a two factor problem right there. And then, well, yeah. And then in tying in with that too, and you, and kind of what you had mentioned with budget earlier, right. Do more with less uh, here. It says in the training units, flying hours and the number of instructors has been cut with one training unit, for example, only having 82 instructor pilots, despite being authorized 114. Oof. So, Oof. You're like, well, why are we ha- why don't we have if we were authorized for that, why don't we have that? Is the one that says you have this much money to use different from the ones who also say this is what you're authorized? Is there a disconnect there? I don't know. Yeah. Right. Now let's let's talk about the maintainers themselves because we gotta we gotta keep the flight going because A, we gotta have so and so be spooled up to actually be proficient to fly. And also we have to fly so many in a certain year and we don't know the budget and all this and that. So it's better to just keep continuously going until they tell us to stop kind of thing. And then so for the maintainers themselves, just that round robin, go, 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 go. It it wears you out as we've all can attest, like any aviation unit or any aviation organization out there, you see the maintainers are like, we're all addicted to caffeine. (laughs) We all operate on at, at least 
at at best i want to say like six hours of sleep at best <laughs> mm-hmm. um yeah, a lot of us, we have to like bridge a, a, a big knowledge gap. We either have like super seasoned um, individuals and then you have brand new guys. There's like no in between. So that, that's, you're, you're exactly right. And that's what it talks about here also in the first paragraph. It says of the maintainer section, um, lack of experience five and seven level supervisors. So for those of you who don't know what five and seven levels are, um, the same thing goes for the maintenance manuals. There's a five level and a seven level. The five level explains to you in third grade enough, uh, enough that a third grader could do the job. Um, remove uh, 120 fasteners from panel such and such panel located in water line, whatever excess of the you know aircraft. And then it'll say uh, remove panel place on rack. Remove um, this component, this component, and this component to get to the actual part you need to change. And then it'll go into a whole step of how you swap and change that part. And then there'll be a whole area of how to perform troubleshooting, a fault isolation, um, and then ops checks afterwards. A seven level is written to where it says gain access to such and such part, uh, remove and replace if necessary, and um, perform ops checks as required. And that's all it'll say. So a five level is written to where no, if you've never seen an aircraft before, you would be able to do the job. And a seven level is written to the, to the, to the side of you're a systems expert and you should know everything you have to do for that specific job. It's giving you a general guideline. Right. And so within my own program, right, we operate on seven levels, which is nice because it gives you a lot of freedom in this and that, but the seven levels are missing a lot of data and we don't exactly have, and not every maintainer is a seven level maintainer. We have a lot of turnover, right? And we Mm -hmm. get new people in there and it's almost impossible to find seven levels for this, for this specific airframe. Cause let's face it. Nobody could be a seven level on every airframe. Right. You know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. to find somebody who's this airframe specific um, is even harder. And so, and so we we can't find seven levels, but we have seven level maintenance manuals and it just leaves a lot to be desired. Right. Creates a lot of headaches. Yeah. And then the maintainers themselves, you know, depending on their training pipeline, some, if not all, will get like not enough training to understand the full extent of their job, of their duties. And in some cases, like this article even says, like airmen could not tell the difference between a ratchet and a socket. They're going into the units to that understanding and they're just left to figure it out. Like, excuse me? (laughs) What? Wow. (laughs) That's bad. But you know, it's funny. I've, I've ran into people like that before and you'll be working on something. Hey, go give me a, go give me a seven eighths box in out of the toolbox. And they come back with a crescent wrench and you're like, I asked for the seven eighths box in. Um, well, this should work too, right? Just adjust to the size you need. Yeah, Mm. but it's, it's, it's the head of this this uh, crescent's too big for the air needed. I need a specific number for this A end fitting. That's why I asked you to bring me a seven eighth. Right. And they're like, they they don't know what it is though. They don't know what a box in wrench was. And you're like, how, how the fuck did you even get here? <laughs> yeah, you know, you start asking questions. You're like, okay, I'm just gonna test the theory. So you go ask them to pick up more stuff, but they don't know. And yeah. they're like, and they're told in their in their initial training, their Gen Fam. You'll learn more on in OJT on the job training. You'll get out there and you'll learn more. But the issue is, is those of us who are out there already, like, yeah, we can t- try to take the time to train, but sometimes this ops schedule doesn't allow for much training to be done. Like, it's just got to be done now. And I don't want to be here for eighteen hours today to make this flight tomorrow morning. So I'm just going to kind of be like, hey, sit this one out, trying to pick up as much as you can, uh, but we're just going to press forward and get it done. Right, and that's like ninety percent of every aviation organization out there, right? A direct quote from this article, knowing that with task saturation and sleep deprivation, work performance suffers. We see human factors and an increase in mishaps. (laughs) Oh, say it ain't so. (laughs) Wow. That goes exactly what you're (laughs) saying. Like, hey, the the job's got to get done. I don't got time to teach you. I mean, shadow me if you can, but just know, like, uh, if you don't learn as you, if you can't learn by seeing, it's not going to happen. And (laughs) that just creates the, the larger knowledge gap. And then you're, you're just trying to get the job done. 
listen, I'm going to read this sentence real quick and you and I are going to laugh hysterically because I can't tell you how many times we've heard this. And I'm sure a bunch of our listeners have heard this too. They don't have experience and are tired. They are tired and crying for help. The response is shut up in color. <laughs> <laughs> my God. Oh, oh my God. I'd be a wealthy man if I could have a have a quarter for every time I've heard that one. <laughs> shut up in color. All right. Uh, I'll be la- over here then. The laughing just covering the tears. <laughs> yeah. Are you crying? No, I'm it's so comical. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I'm tearing up. <laughs> so true. Please help me. <laughs> Please help. But like it even says you're crying for help. Like, and that's exactly what it is in many cases. Like, hey, you guys gotta do this. Like, like just hear me out from my side, Mr. Mr. Flight Ops <laughs> or Mr. Program Director. Let's hear from my side. What if, what if we didn't do this and we actually came up with a legit plan that was more with a goal that was more reachable? Yeah. I know, I know. What a novel idea. Just hear me out. And yeah, like, that, yeah, that doesn't color. sound like the direction we're going into. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and then that's where the shut up and color response comes from. Holy cow, that's funny. Yeah, right. Sad. Funny, funny, sad, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and then we're kind of going back to what we're talking about with the, about the whole service member concept. Uh, some of these issues, the, the commission recommends that the military fence maintainers from additional duties so they can focus on their main role. They, they shouldn't have to do things like pulling security or providing security <laughs> to the base. <laughs> yeah, don't we have don't we have actual what are they calling like MPs for that shit? Yeah, right. Like actual security security. Like that's their whole purpose in life. Like you know? That's their MOS is, is security. Yeah. Yeah. But, what was that? You said you had the duty desk. And I remember our old uh, co-worker, uh, we'll call him Clegg. Clegg. Uh, he talked about re- working duty desk. You'd be out there for 18 hours work and then had to go sit on the duty desk for the next 24 hours. And then you were back on back on the hangar floor. So it was like 72 hours where you weren't really sleeping. Yeah. I think you had to pull that several times. Oh, several times, man. Um, now, they, nowadays, they've had some controls in it where they said, like, if you if you're working a 24 hour period of no sleep, you rate uh, a 24 hour rest day, which thank God for that. But. Some of them, they'll have like this little clause that says like uh, uh, do, the person on duty may opt to uh, take a nap for like two hours or some shit. And then they'll count that as like, oh, you were you were allowed to sleep. So you back to work. You go I'm like the fuck. Yeah. But no. God help you if you were caught sleeping. Yeah. That's pretty much like it. it's like uh, you you're you may take the time to sleep, but um, don't sleep. Like, fuck. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then. And a lot of it too is like, so you're getting wrung out, you're getting dragged out, you're getting just overworked. And then you start to ask yourself like, well, what's the incentive for me for staying? Like, why, <clears throat> why should I stay? Yeah. And, and that's kind of like the problem a lot of services are face or a lot of industries are facing now is like, what's the incentive to stay with all this bullshit going on? And uh, some of these, the commission here recommends that they incentivize um, service members to get their A&P license while they're in service, right? Make that be a promotable thing versus like how many pull-ups can you do or how many, how fast can you run a mile or some shit like that. And I agree. Uh, yeah. Cause I, I mean, half the time they say, Hey, I want to do this chief. And the chief's like, why? You don't need that here. I'm like not here, but, but I, I'm going to need it for the next phase of life. You know? Right. W- what do you mean? You thinking about getting out? And that's all they hear is that they skew it to be like, so you're thinking about getting out, thinking about leaving. Think about quitting. Think about quitting. <laughs> you going to war? You want ready to go to war, Blocky? Like, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just, I just want to better myself. <laughs> yeah, I, right. That, that's an that's an actual like improvement versus then like yeah, I, I can crush a mile in like ten, in like ten seconds. Like that's cool, but unless you're gonna do a strongman competition, I don't see where that applies much. <laughs> Yeah, or is that you're, you're the guy who can do a thousand push-ups? So all he should be doing is being in a recruiting office and traveling around to local high schools, right? Like, just like go ahead, go ahead, throw throw bullets at me and just watch it bounce off my chest, kind of thing. <laughs> but what they really need is that salty ass uh, master sergeant 
to go around to the high schools with a cigarette hanging around his mouth and smelling of <laughs> smelling of whiskey, you know, like, like, let me tell you about the military kids, <laughs> fucking deep sunk eyes, you know, right. rings around. It's just, Can you imagine, man? Let me tell you about working planes. <laughs> They should do, they should make a movie of that where like Clint Eastwood is a recruiter. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh my like god, that? that would be awesome! <laughs> Just the saltiest old. <laughs> what you know about Vietnam? <laughs> what you know about Nam? He's got that thousand yard stare. Right. And you talk about fixing planes while I get shot at by Charlie covered in napalm. <laughs> right, but like say like incentives like that, right? Like, hey, we're going to reward you for getting an AMP while you're in service. That will actually make me, at least me, feel like I'm an actual professional in my damn job. You know, not just, I'm just here to slave away while we never see a a light at the end of the tunnel. And then say like for commercial airliners, right? We're incentivizing. You did a fantastic job, bro. Like, we're going to give you a bump up in your pay. We're going to give you like this toolbox for free. Some shit, right? Something of some kind of value that says like, hey, we appreciate your hard work. And it's not just you slaving away for hours and hours and hours. And then we just accept it as a, a team win instead of you personally slaving away for all that amount of and time. They w- and I don't think they would even have to go that in depth with the incentive, the incentive for majority of the people that I've talked to and myself included is time off. Yes. Hey man, you guys kicked ass. Uh, Friday's on us. Enjoy the long weekend. Like, all right. All right. And I think you and uh, one of our former coworkers, um, um, I don't want to say his name, so we'll just say it backwards. Door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, he had talked about where it was one of those like, "Hey, if you go X amount of time with no mishaps and and whatever you know meeting mission requirements and this and that, um, time off, you know, yeah, time off so valuable to people." Oh, no kidding. Because, I mean, you can't tax time off. <laughs> it just. Well, that's true. You know, you can you can tax. Uh, well, I mean, sure, there's a way. I'm sure there's a way you can work, work that. Say, well, you fat can tax time off. Like, sure, you can tax my money, but you can't take my you can't take my actual time away from me if I'm already doing it. I mean, then that's kind of been like the incentive. Uh, what myself and our coworker did. Like, I actually had like a spinny wheel that. uh it had all my team's names on it. And then whatever, whatever the needle lands, like, Hey, it's your day off. Bye. <laughs> Go home, dude. Like, really? Dip, bro. I can. <laughs> See you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for kicking ass. You know? Yeah. Oh, all right. Cool. But that kind of, yeah, man, that, I think that would be even the biggest incentive over even just like, Hey, here's your, here's your toolbox. Thanks for doing whatever. Here's a plaque, you know? Yeah. Here's a, here's a piece of paper that says you, you did good. Like, nah, man, let me, let me get that extra day here and there. Right. And then maybe after so many quarters of you kicking ass and then, and that extra day, like, oh, on top of your extra day, here's a plaque where here's like a check for something. Like, oh, sweet, dude. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And so some other systematic problems, you know, are, our lack of parts, which we've covered, covered in other episodes. Six already mentioned, uh, um, an erratic funding program. Mm hmm. Um, and then, well, here's one. It says jets are coming out of the depot were in worse shape than when they started. Oh, shit. oh, let, let us tell all you about that. So like, how does it come back from the depot more fucked up? Like, let, let's explain a little, it might, like, there's only so many times you can break your leg and not, and it won't affect you in the future. You know what I'm saying for everybody? Mm-hmm. Like when, when you beat up a plane so much, there's only so, there's only, a finite amount of fixes a depot level can do before we just like, yo, this thing's got to, this plane's got to go. <laughs> Think about work, a work hardening a piece of metal. You take a piece of metal and you bend it back and forth repeatedly over and over and over. And in that area where it, that one specific area where it's bending, eventually it, it work hardens itself enough to where it just snaps. That's, ex- that's the same thing. Yep. Yep. It's just, it's crazy. Um, and then it talks about sequestration by Congress. Um, the unpredictable funding. Uh, you don't plan exercises uh, because you don't know if you'll have the funding. Can't do budget stuff because of it. Can't can't. It's just hard to plan. Um, all that kind of all that kind of stuff. So, what are the recommendations to fix all this? Right. Mm-hmm. So the group 
um, that did this report uh, briefed lawmakers in a closed hearing. Um, the commission specific, specifically called on lawmakers and the Pentagon to adopt an aggressive and coordinated approach to understand the psychological needs of aviators, Ooh. better reward and incentivize professional achievements for maintainers, firmly establish safety responsibility in the defense uh, department by creating a joint safety council, Ooh. update and modify force protection key performance parameters to incorporate aviation human system safety. What a novel idea. Can't believe that's not in there yet. Uh, link simulator sustainment to aircraft production upgrades and modifications. Hmm. That's an interesting one. And then stop using continuing resolutions to fund national security, military readiness, and aviation safety. Ooh, ooh, there's the finishing up right there. <laughs> stop using. It's like continue. punch, 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 and then the fucking haymaker. <laughs> Boom. For a dramatic effect. Rocky wins. <laughs> Stop using, stop using continuing resolutions to fund programs. Holy shit. <laughs> Triggered. I'm here triggering in my seat. Yeah. <laughs> Can you break that down for us a little bit, Six? Just for some of the listeners. So stop using continuing resolutions. What that means is like, don't use your old solutions to fix new problems. You know? and that includes- Just like that Dave Chappelle skit. Modern, yeah. when he's being Barack Obama. Modern problems require modern solutions. <laughs> I still love that skit, man. <laughs> right. So, and that's kind of like the mindset we've had since ever since, right? Like we find a new problem, we use old methods to fix it, which it's, it, it may work in some cases, but for the most part, right. That's when you find out that your processes have gaps, right? Hence the whole continuous improvement system, which 99% of every industry out there has. Like if you're you supposed to have supposed to, right? <laughs> now, if you, if you find when you try to implement a solution, which to a new problem, you find out it doesn't work. You don't just beat your head against the fence and say, well, it's the, it's the new problem's fault, not our system, which is majority of the excuses I would call for every single one of us out there that do that. Well, it's not our process. That's the problem. It's the new problem. That's the problem. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> so what are we going to do to fix it? I mean, we just ignore it. it it'll go away. It, it'll go away. Just just watch. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, we had one person tell us when we were doing a process audit. They're like, well, my document's not wrong. It's that people aren't following the document. Therefore, you can't fail my document because the document states everything as it's supposed to be uh, followed. It's just people aren't following it. And my response to him was, Exactly. And whose responsibility is it to ensure that what their document states is being adhered to? And I kind of leaned in. My eyes got a little bigger, like leaning towards him, like, eh, come mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. you can do it. And they're like, well, I'm not quality. I'm like, you don't have to be fucking quality if you own the document. <laughs> right. You're the one who makes it. And then I come and tell you if you're fucked up. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> like, last I checked, quality is everyone's responsibility. Ooh. Ooh. And it was on a rug. <laughs> Outside the front door. <laughs> Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm thinking that mirror. <laughs> I just imagine everybody who's a who's a who's a slack jaw. You know what I mean? That's just. But I can't do that. <laughs> they just make that noise. I don't know why they make that noise in my head, but that's what they do. They, I'm, I'm the same way. <laughs> Oh, fucking hold on. I got to catch my breath on that one. Because, the, I mean, your, your document is not wrong. Got it, right? But if I have to bring, like, a decoder ring to figure out what the hell you're saying, there's some gaps. You know? Yeah, there's some gaps. Or, or I'm, I guess I'm telling you, if your document's not wrong and you're telling me it's because people aren't hearing it following your document, then I guess I'm here to tell you that you're wrong because you're not following your document. Ooh, left hook <laughs> and you're like well no i just write the document and maintain it yeah and it's also your responsibility to make ensure that it's being followed that's why we have this process in place like you know like well i'm not calling you like yeah when we audit your process we can't be we can't be i guess we're sidetracking here from really what we were talking about in this re- in this uh, episode but if I have to be the enforcer of every document, then fine, I'll be the enforcer of every document, but you've now worked yourself out of a job. Yeah, right. Like, what is your purpose at this point? Because I'm the one who's who's 
auditing it, updating it, and enforcing it, then you're here for. Yeah. Nudge, nudge. Anyways, sorry about that uh, side rant there, everybody. That's just been some uh, lingering frustrations over the last couple of months from me personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of, well, that does tie in, right? Because like when you don't have the know-how, you, how are you going to expect to actually do it right? And and that kind of goes into like this one meme we posted uh, some time ago about like uh like maintain main, maintenance manual notes when they're all over the fucking place. I'm like, which one do I listen to, man? And then. Yeah, there, there's contradicting statements in here. It's like, uh, I don't get it. Like, shall must do, but they're they're opposite of each other. So, do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't the understand. will shall must statements. You will do this, um, but you must do this. Well, if I will do that, but that's opposite of what I must do. So, what am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> uh, I, lo- I love the ones when they try to argue that shall supersedes will and must. <laughs> Look, no, no. no it see, doesn't. it says shall. That means that supersedes everything else. Like, because I'm telling you to do it. It's like, yeah, but it it also says must and will. That's kind of the same thing. I mean, we're 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 splitting hairs at this point. So, I mean, yeah, that's clarifying. what I had people try to argue that too, and I'm like, look. uh, if it if you shall do something or you will do something or you must do something, uh, I tell everybody I'm like look read those all with the same intensity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just if it if if it says shall will or must, you're going to comply with it. Right. I don't have to tell you. Yeah, but this one's higher ranking than this one. I don't give a shit. You're still going to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. It just depends on which one you're going to do first. Right. So that's when you go clarify, clarify instructions, please, <laughs> please, please. I mean, I, I don't want to get my fingers crushed. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Holy cow. Uh, so, yeah, this this article, it painted a pretty dismal picture about uh, mishaps and maintenance failures and whatnot. Um, the sad part is, is like uh, this stuff is still ongoing and we get it. It's it, it's going to be a tough ship to turn around. But the mindset kind of, the, the change kind of has to start with us as the individual, right? We can't just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over and then just expect someone to just say, okay, everyone stop what you're doing. Let's try a new way. Or, or like this thing said, stop using the continuing resolutions to fix the, fix new problems. And just, I can't, it, it bugs my mind that we still do that and we haven't figured it out yet to change it up. Yeah, so. I mean, there's there's uh, the saying of don't reinvent the wheel, but in some instances, the wheel needs the wheel needs made better, right? You need to use better uh, better alloys and better rubber compounds. You know, it's just uh, don't reinvent the wheel, but you can make it better, right? So, yeah, there's a there's a huge difference between trying to remake a new one or to just polish up what's already there. You know, like there's a lot mm-hmm. of a lot of procedures and processes have a lot of fluff that doesn't pertain anymore like um certain verbiage is for older variants of a plane that doesn't exist no more we can cut those out of the mix or certain things are a little unclear in the instructions like the shall must do part like we were just talking about maybe like cut a few of that out or make it a little bit more um distinct i guess the the word would be or a little bit yeah, more instead of using shall will must it's everything Everything use one word. You will do this. You will do that. You will. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Or like, uh, like we were saying, like if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. <laughs> everything's priority one. Priority yeah, one. If everything's number one, then nothing's number one. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, closing thoughts, MVP. I think we already kind of hit them on the head. Um, I know we've kind of touched on this subject before a few times, but you know, we we like to keep it forefront and center in the minds to to just know that. Um, it's a tough, tough, tough issues to solve. And it's going to take more than just six to myself on here, uh, rambling on about it. Right. Um, you know, if the, you know, it's going to take, uh, take a collective, uh, group from, from the federal side through the civilian side to, uh, change the hearts and minds and, and ultimately get it to a better spot. And, and it will, right. Not every day is a, a complete train wreck. Um, just be as safe as you can. And, and, you know, raise your hand, looking for clarity when you need it. Right, exactly that. And we're we're not just we're not here to just talk shit about this 
about one particular service branch or organization, the continuous improvement chain, it's a, as it is, it's a continuing thing. And there's always going to be gaps whenever a new problem arises or it's the system's not going to stay perfect. New things are to get interjected into it. That's going to cause a lot of hiccups and um, stoppages. Right. But mm -hmm. we got to be at least have the mindset to be able to see when it's coming and be able to trace it back to its root cause and then figure out a plan for it afterwards. Because if we didn't improve any processes, we'd still be flying like the paper, paper wing airplanes that take yeah, like fab fabric wing birds. Right. And carry like two people per plane and stuff like that. So, <laughs> or maybe it wouldn't even be that far. That would have been for a short time. And like, ah, this is this new modern fang dangled flying. Right. This is for the birds. <laughs> And we're back to horses and buggies and walking. Right. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe, uh, also, we'll also be dropping the, there's a report within the report about it breaks it down all kinds of deep, gives numbers and stuff. We'll put that into the link of the episode as well. But again, like it's all, it all like the, the process chain of improvement starts with the lowest part person possible. And it only takes is just one, one, one individual to sound the alarm and, and start the whole chain. It doesn't have to take someone of significant influence. It can be someone at the lowest level, at the lowest. Uh, yeah. Uh, One thing I did appreciate about this article was that the people conducting this report or this uh, review or whatever you want to call it, they talked to the pilots. They talked to the maintainers. They didn't talk to their leadership because mm -hmm. the leadership's going to go, everything's fine here. Nope, they went down to the lowest level. So just like Six said, they know they know where the change has got to got to be put instilled and right. so they go to the people who are affected the most yep absolutely and, and sometimes all it takes is just continually say, voicing those problems continually pointing out those problems establishing trends and all this other stuff so it can move forward there, there we, we can go down the rabbit hole of what constitutes as a bitch and an, an actual complaint but if you got data and and a trend to prove it it kind of goes from being a bitch to an actual complaint just saying <laughs> Yeah, you go from a risk to an actual issue. Yep. On that note, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have a good day. Yay, bye. Bye. We'd like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to continue to make episodes, maintain our gear, and create merch for all of our listeners with special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Ryan Frushauer, Dan Schubert, Jenny Dignan, and the ladies of the Dick Talk and Mimosas podcast. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. Visit our shop at cancelformaintenance.com and grab some swag to show off both your support for us and your prowess as an aircraft technician. If you have ideas for the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, visit our contact us section and send us a line. We will do what we can to get your ideas or yourself on the show. You can also follow us on social media such as on Facebook at Cancel for Maintenance. Instagram at Kanks, that's C-A-N-X for Maintenance Podcast, or on Twitter at C-X-M-X Podcast. Check out some of our affiliates like Rockwell Time, where they make both rugged and classy watches to fit your lifestyle. Use the code CX4MX and save 10% off your purchase. Support us on Patreon. Our patrons get exclusive perks such as access to our Discord, discounts and early access to merch special patron-only episodes, and so much more. Thank you again so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.